Coming up on Theater Talk. The drama of the decline of Bob Hope yeah. and yeah. staying on too long yeah, on yeah, the world yeah. stage Brilliantly and told. the stage uh, is in that book is so beautifully handled and so touching. And, and it, I, I cried a couple of times for him and me. <laughs> and could not Thank you. Yes. let it go. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and the Honorable Thomas Mercer Ray. I may need smelling salts. I just looked in the wings and Bob Hope is standing there. <laughs> New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And Susan, I am in love with show business lore and legends and show business figures, and I love biographies about great show business icons. And I have read an absolutely superb book about one of my heroes. Yes, I confess it. I'm a Republican. This is why I loved him. Bob Hope. I grew up with Bob Hope. I never missed an NBC special as a kid growing up, and I met Bob Hope once at the Republican National Convention in Dallas, Texas, and it was the highlight of my life. Bob Hope is the subject of a terrific new book called Hope by a fine writer and a good friend of mine, Richard Zoglin. Welcome to Theater Talk, Richard. Great to be here. And just to, you know, I guess for comic relief, Dick Cavett is here because he, <laughs> <laughs> he knew something about Bob Hope and he, he knows yeah, something about yeah. comedy. He knew Bob Hope and right? he was friends with Bob Hope. Oh, why did you cut that introduction so short? Met him first in Lincoln, Nebraska and last on my show and the gap between still seems incredible to me. I, I have a hearing aid and it sounded like you said you were a Republican. Then I <laughs> <laughs> it's true. No, I, I, was, I, was, all right, I was fourth graders for Ford. <laughs> All right, okay. and I was I was a page at the uh, Dallas convention, uh -huh. eighty four, when Reagan was recrowned, renominated, and we were in the I think it was it was a Trammell Crow Hotel. It's now I think it was the Wyndham Hotel, and That's I was important. yeah I was fifteen or fourteen years old, and I'm walking through the lobby, and Bob Hope comes in. He's wearing this I kid you not, he's wearing a pantsuit, uh, a light pink, wow. light blue striped pantsuit, and he's walking his dog, and his dog has the exact same pantsuit on. Get out of here now, <laughs> totally. and we will finish this show. <laughs> it's true. You want to know how I met the great Bob? Yes. Yeah. Great. Hi, this is Bob Boxing Gloves Hope. Um, I met him in Lincoln, Nebraska, the obvious place. He came there with a variety hour. A friend of mine and I went, knowing that it would be a film, it couldn't be Bob Hope in Lincoln, because we'd just seen him in Monsieur Beaucaire. You know? <laughs> And they had a lot of variety acts, intermission. We didn't know what intermission was. We started to go home, we came back, and then that second act started, and we thought more jugglers and magicians and dogs. And now the star of our show, Bob Hope. <laughs> God, and he walked onto the stage. We were at sort of an angle. He seemed to be coming straight toward us. And my friend Lyle Burke said, Jesus, there he is. <laughs> Nothing but air between us. He was hilarious. We ran around to the stage door after which he came down some steps. And I said, fine show, Bob. I was in junior high. <laughs> and he said, thanks, son. And the next day I told all my friends I'd been chatting with Bob Hope. Yes. <laughs> Years later, I look in the wings. Yes, he's there. He's coming out on my show. I told him that story and he said, hey, was that you? <laughs> well, when I met him, when I, when I went, I said, oh, well, Mr. Hope, could I have your autograph? And he said, you're too young to be a Republican. Which is a great <laughs> line. I, and I he love, you know, had... Bob didn't always need his writers. That was a great line, ad-libbed line. But what you know, I how glad I am that you said that. I used yeah. to get in fights on the playgrounds with kids who'd say, Bob Hope can't ad-lib, right after his radio show. Right. Before. He, you know, he has these things called writers and they write down jokes and he reads them into a microphone. It's true. And I said, you're full of ordure probably in fifth grade. <laughs> you told me a few, uh, several lines, and Larry Gelbart said to me, uh, you know, Bob's was, was always funnier than his monologues. Bob in person was funnier than his monologues. Isn't that something? Yeah. From Gelbart. Gelbart, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, Richard, um, uh, the obvious question, of course, I mean, uh, Bob Hope for many people is ancient history, represents 
Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, a lot of stuff that like my left-wing crazy commie I friend Susan doesn't want to uh, think about anymore. Why were you interested in researching this man's life and bringing him back to restoring him, I think, uh, the way you have done with this book? Well, first of all, I grew up loving his stuff, too. I watched those road pictures over and over again. I loved him. I, too, was in that generation that kind of turned off to Bob Hope because of Vietnam and that difficult time. But, you know, I always thought he ought to be, you know, looked at, you know, aside from all the political baggage. Mm -hmm. Plus, I did this book on stand-up comedy called Comedy at the Edge about stand-up comedy in the mm -hmm. 70s. And I used to ask each of the guys that I interviewed, from George Carlin to Steve Martin to through Jerry Seinfeld, I would always ask them who their influences were, who they grew up with, who they loved. Nobody ever mentioned Bob Hope. Not once. <laughs> wow. And, and that was so, you know, astonishing to me because... I believe he really invented their art form. When you think about it, I was trying to see, I really looked into who really founded stand-up comedy. There were vaudeville comedians before Bob Hope, but they were very different. It was Bob that um, said to his writers when he started on radio in 1938, you know what, read the papers and give me some yes. lines out of the papers, or stuff that's happening in his real life, it's playing golf. Revolutionary idea in yeah. comedy. Well, but, real, so but, Will, but Will Rogers, Will Rogers. As, you, as, you, as you make the point, very interestingly, I think, in this book, Will Rogers had the folksy kind of topical stuff, That's but right. Bob Hope brought the urbanity, the sophistication, right. the And the vaudeville rhythm, the, you know, the, the, the rhythms, the fast pace and His everything. fabulous diction. He never blows he, them. Oh, really, amazing. You, you hear him so much on radio, how little he, he stumbles, so much so that when he did make a little stumble, he would always make a point of it yeah. because they were so rare. Right, right. Yeah, I heard him say, uh, as if it was, a, that was an old lady, that might, uh, uh, or something sideways like that, yeah. he said. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? There was a line. It was probably written, but I remember some radio thing where he says, uh, uh, she said, oh, some cute girls on the radio, and she says, oh, Bob, you're such a ham. And he says, right now I'm bacon. <laughs> oh, well. I, I think I told you this one, Richard, but he came to Lincoln and played a golf game with some Republican friends, of course, and uh, he loved the golf course, yeah. and I didn't know it. And the next day, a snotty little kid said, how come you didn't see Bob Hope? And I said, Bob Hope? He said, yeah, and a kid said to him, uh, because he was wearing a flowing Hawaiian shirt, a kid said to him, hey, Bob, your slip is showing. <laughs> and Hope said, so is your father's. <laughs> I, didn't get, I didn't get it for about a year. <laughs> <laughs> but Dick, let me ask you. I mean, you you were you know you're you're not exactly a Republican, I would say. Not did entirely. You ever, no, no, no. Did no. you ever turn on Bob Hope? Did was there a period where you thought you know I I I'm going to turn on this guy because he's turn Nixon's him, friend? Yeah, turn uh, against him. No, no, never. I understood. I knew he was a lifelong Republican. I knew he felt that this country had given him everything he could have wanted and more. He was a patriot in the old sense. And he, like so many, were wrong about the war we got our butt kicked in. And uh, because it was his habit to go on and defend it. And Kennedy gave him a medal, and uh, he was... Uh, Clinton he, loved him? I asked Mort Lockman, his producer, head writer, yeah, yeah. once, who does Bob like? He said, Bob likes any politician, any movie star, any sports star, any Vatican biggie, anybody who's big generals, and influence. And, you know. Generals. He generals. 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 Yeah, well, right. you write about Richard, his childhood. He came from England. He was dirt poor. Yep. He struggled. Um, he struggled in vaudeville. You know, when yeah. he got into show business, it took him a long time to make it. Yeah. And uh, he started performing on the street to bring money. I mean, they yeah. were, there were seven brothers, and, uh, you know, going That's back right. to childhood, he's, it, was, it was not easy. That's where he got that work ethic. Yeah. And that he had to, to really work at it. You know, nothing came overnight and easy to Bob Hope in, in show business. And, mm -hmm. wow, he was, uh, you know, a workaholic. When you One of the countless thrills of your book, if I may say that, we just sitting there, is the way <laughs> you take us into each of his media, from vaudeville yeah. to theater to television to movies, and impossibly. And TV. He go, and, and then and television, he goes straight to the top. His television yeah. career was largely crap, but his <laughs> monologues were fabulous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was even in one of those deadly sketches, but let that were pass. You? What? Yeah. Really? Which I one? didn't see that one. At the New Orleans World's Fair in a, in a <laughs> baseball locker room. And I loved seeing him as he always did. When he came on in a costume, he didn't just come on and start the line. He, like a model, moved around so you could see his <laughs> costume, and then he started. <laughs> I love it. And, uh, <laughs> oh, gee, it was, that, that was a 
dream come true, but that's such a cliche. Uh, but, but what a comedian in terms of technique. But Richard, I, I wanted to ask you, where do you think, I mean, having traced his life, going back to his parents, his upbringing, where does that Bob Hope sense of timing come from? How does it, where does it come from and how does it develop? I guess it developed in vaudeville when he had to, you know, entertain But even before crowds, vaudeville, there must have been something in the family that... The timing, <laughs> the you know, timing family. He always <laughs> used to talk about his father was was a very funny guy. But yeah. I always think I think that's sort of a cliche. I'm not so sure, you know, how how true that is. I think it's a well, kind of his father was sort of a happy drunk, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he he was. You know, he was a, yeah. alcoholic. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Bob was never really a drinker. No, nope. and several of the brothers were big Alcohol, drinkers. Yeah. So uh, yeah. amazing that he he avoided that. You couldn't have the work ethic Bob Hope had if you were drunk. No, that's from no, the mother. No. Yeah. I think and timing is a pointless thing to talk yeah. about, quite frankly. I asked, Good timing, I drop a name, <laughs> Jack Benny, and I, yeah. one show, just as we was going off, I said, they always talk about your timing, your timing. Can you tell us? And he said, you know, kid, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> I said, well, what is timing to you? And he said, I say the line the way I think it should be said when it should be said. And if you don't have that instinct, you can't learn timing. Yeah. You can't learn to count to three. I mean, it's except though in your book, though you Bob honed his, for lack of a better word, Dick timing in vaudeville in yeah. front of live audiences and part taking of it, their measure. Yeah, and part of it was confidence too that he could wait for the laugh. Mm -hmm. He, uh, you know, he. He, he had to work to different audiences and kind of get the feel of different audiences and how long it took to, for them to get jokes and stuff. And I think, you know, vaudeville, you know, just a guy who has to constantly work to stay afloat in vaudeville, you've got to just constantly be sensitized to every audience and to what's happening elsewhere in, in vaudeville and how, you know, he would borrow things, he would steal things, he would just do anything he could to One of the other But another I... person could have gone through all those things and with no instinct, yep. not yeah. good, gotten and any not... better. But, but one of the right things time. I find fascinating, though, about this book, because it's, 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 in a way, it's, it's just bigger than this man. He was somebody who understood the business of show business, oh. how to build himself up as a Fabulous brand. Fabulous career management. You say, Abs I think you say micromanaged his career somewhere in the well, book. He, he did, and he was yeah. also the first brand guy. You know, he, he branded himself in a way that no other Hollywood star, I don't think at that time, he, he wasn't just Bob Hope's star of movies and radio, uh, but he wrote books starting very early on before he was practically just come to Hollywood, and he already wrote a, a kind of a jokey autobiography. And then his book about World War II, and these were bestsellers. He wrote a newspaper column in the late 40s. He, of course, had a golf tournament name for him. And how many stars had their own logo? I mean, the, yes. the, the line-drawn profile uh, with the chin and the, and the nose. I had said to you earlier that I, in reading your book, I did wonder, because he, from very early on, managed this squad of writers and yeah. this business. And I said to you, well, here he, here he was raised by this mother while the father was off, you know, drinking the paycheck and all this. This mother is seven sons who she mm -hmm. managed, when <laughs> brought over by herself on, in steerage to America. And I wonder if this wasn't, he wasn't looking at how this mother managed all these boys and kept this, this operation going. That's a very Seven little hopes. interesting Seven little <laughs> yeah. observation. I, I, you, know, yeah. you know, maybe so. He but certainly uh, learned from his mother, you know. What do you think, Dick? He learned from his brother, too, who out there, one of them especially, yeah. who out in California in the early days said, you know, it seems to me that this land between Beverly Hills and all these cabbage farms till you get to Hollywood will be valuable someday. Yeah. <laughs> and he got some. Yeah. <laughs> he bought most of it. You were around him. I mean, was when, when Bob Hope arrived for whatever taping a TV show, was it, it was like the president had arrived? I mean, was the, the entourage? Was he... When he came off the elevator, the place lit up. Yeah. I mean, it was just that dazzling personality, a fabulous personality. He's a handsome man, too, even yeah. though he said, but I, I get, don't say that, I got to keep the nose jokes. Yeah. And so, but he, he was uh, Did you travel a with presence an you could feel. Did, did, was there an entourage around him when you saw him? One, no. Yeah. He would come in in a Burberry coat, and uh, I held it once and laid it aside for him, and I went through the pockets. There was a <laughs> package of certs. And then after the show, I followed him down the stairs after saying goodbye to him, and I watched him walk out into 30 Rock and go around a corner like one shot in The Third Man, 
And I thought, he's going to walk up there and people are going to recognize him, or not. One day, I'm innocently watching Dave Letterman, and Bob said, Mr. Hope said, hey, I'm taking Dick Cavett to the Army-Navy game. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it. That's in your book. That's in my book. That's <laughs> he did take me. But did people recognize him on the street? I mean, he couldn't go anywhere without sure. Like me, a little kid, Republican, sure. you know. But he knew how to walk in airports. People, yes. You know, he would walk fast. And he would say hello to everybody, but he moved. And he'd have a hat on, usually, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, now, there's a dark side to Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. described, for example, someone said he never apologized, he rarely said thank you, and had an essential coldness to him. Well, yeah. yeah. And he doesn't sound like he was the best father or husband. No. Well, no. In this man's book, he walks into his own home and one of the kids says, Hi, Bob Hope. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. That, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are a, a, an internationally famous TV star. Oh, Is easily. That, <laughs> yes. Does that come with the territory of being so famous that you become on distant some level distant and aloof and, and, and have to, you know, uh, Swat them away without yeah, yeah, and, 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 and squire around babes and, and ignore your it, family? It, it Is that can, part of it? It can. Yeah. Uh, it, it can be too hard to handle. The constant recognition is a dreadful bore, but great fun f for the first two weeks. And after that, it, 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 it can make you as unpopular in the business as, oh, just to make up a name, Danny Kay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, his initials are Danny Kay. I don't want to say it. <laughs> but, you know, I think it was a combination of his. English sort of reserve mm. and a just lack of introspection. He was just a, a guy. He didn't he didn't want to talk much about himself or think much so about himself. So people who even were close to him didn't feel like they knew him very well. Yeah, somebody there said, might not have been much to know. Somebody said deep down inside, Bob Hope, there is no Bob there Hope. There is no Bob Hope. That's great. Right. And I loved when you pointed out, that I didn't know this, that Johnny Carson got sick to death of his oh. coming on the show. Yeah. Oh. Every time he had something to plug, walking in in the middle of all the guest is on, doing eight gags and leaving. He, and Mr. Woody Allen said to me, Cavett, do you think you could get him to talk on a show? He swaps gags, and I did. You did the best of anybody. I did, uh, and I'd say your... things like, how'd you get that scar? I lived in Bristol, and I protected my dog one day, and I got hit with a rock right there. And it's still there, the uh, little, scar yeah, little, there? little indentation there. He talked like a person, which he could do wonderfully. And yet, at one point, he gave an answer, and he said, hey, would you rather have a gag on that? Yeah. And I said, no, 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 no. But, the, but, but did he become a... I don't want to be too um, meta, as the kids say, but did he become a prisoner of Bob Hope, the creature he created, that everything had to be a gag? Yeah, he felt that he was a public figure. He was, you know, more public than anybody, and he, he just felt he constantly had to support that image. Um, Why does this happen? Here's a man we talked about who was a great ad-libber who could yes. ad-lib in the early career, could ad-lib anything, you know. Yep. Oh, Bob, you're ham, now I'm bacon, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Why then does he have to be surrounded by a battery of gag writers? And well, he, 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 I don't know if you know, he taped his monologue for Friday on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, and, and had got writers write new stuff all the time. But yes, he was a man who, when he reached up under a miniskirt of one of his stars boarding a plane, and she turned around and said, you can't do that. And he said, read your contract. <laughs> uh, you knew he could handle almost anything. Yeah, but, well, but he, well, just, you know, who, having to do so much material, constantly yeah, traveling, you know, you know, f five and six concerts a, di a week sometimes. Uh, and, not, you know, plus his TV shows, he just had to have that barrage of, of material. But he was comfortable enough that he knew that you know he could ad lib on top of it if he had to, and he did, a lot. But I, you know, going on talk shows and stuff, he was he was of the old school. You write stuff and you go on. The idea of of what we're doing, spontaneous uh, conversation. conversation. Well, uh, Susan wrote all my gags, which is why I'm so good on the show. Now we've been plugging this book, but there's this other. Oh rather, my God! Now the show rather, starts. Rather slim tone, I have to say. <laughs> uh, oh my God! Look at how. You haven't changed a bit, Dick. Th those are my Times columns, another s wide selection of them. Dick Cavett There may Breed not be Cavett. a line in there as popular as the one about Sarah Palin in the first book, which was, she seems to have no first language. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> read Mel Brooks' blurb. It'll only take a second. It's on the cover. On the cover? Yeah. That's on the back. The, back. the best bathroom reading ever written. <laughs>
Aww. Each story takes just the right amount of time. <laughs> by the way, for the reader who must buy this book before they do War and Peace or the Bible, in my eyes, um, the drama of the decline of Bob Hope yes. and yeah. staying on too long yeah, on yeah, the world yeah. stage, brilliantly told stage, uh, is in that book is so beautifully handled and so touching, and and it, I I cried a couple of times for him, and me. <laughs> he could not Thank you. Yes. let it go. Why not? He could. I mean, his life in front of the camera, life in front of the microphone, just... Yeah, I think he, he was so driven. You know, this was a guy who thought all the time about his career. This is why he had a kind of impoverished personal life. All he was doing was, was managing his career all the time, growing up with the kids, and he was running off every Christmas and so forth. And he just couldn't imagine a time... You know, when he wasn't on stage managing that career. Oh, you tell about when they <laughs> forced him to take a vacation and he went up to Canada and tried sitting out in a boat and throwing the line out and something. He said, hey, I had to come back. I heard that fish don't applaud. <laughs> and, uh, he, really, uh, he couldn't take it. He, he, he couldn't do it. That's right. Not for long. He'd get ready to go to Europe or something uh, on, a, on a trip in the early days and they, he'd book himself in, in Chicago, Cleveland and Atlantic City on the way to on the New way. York. To on the way, on the Isn't, is, is that what Jay Leno was like? I mean, because in the sense that there's somebody... He seems to be addicted yeah. to performing and, yeah. and happy to do it. Joan Rivers, she sought love yep. from audiences. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I stepped in front of an army audience once at uh, Killeen, Texas, Fort whatever it is, and they applauded me, and I was an unknown comedian, and the jolt that hit your face, oh. mm. I realized Bob Hope's addiction. And right yeah. after the war, an old writer I worked with on the Par Show said, you know, after the war, Bob was just at loose ends, and he said, I had to drive him to colleges before this was fashionable, yeah. and so he could get another big audience fix. Right, those audiences, that adulation, and, and also the sense that he was really bringing something that those men needed. There's a wonderful moment in your book, though, which I think really uh, we've discussed Bob Hope and maybe there is no Bob Hope there and we can never know it, but I think beautiful scene where he's performing in the north of England and a troop of guys, yeah. they, walk ten, they walk 10 miles to see Bob Hope. They get to the theater. Well, you tell the story. Uh, yeah, they, they, Bob was going to miss them, so they found out. They walked 10 miles to see one of his shows. They got to the show out in some, you know, the moor, in the middle of the moors, yeah. and uh, it was an indoor show, and it was full, and they couldn't see him. So they sadly started trudging back, the 10 miles back. After the show, Bob heard about it, grabbed his troop, hopped in a couple of jeeps, caught up with the guys, and did a show in the rain for the guys out in the middle. Rem remind me if I told you this, Richard, it's interesting about micromanaging his life, his health, his movements, his career. I said to him once, you know, traveling that time and the food is so awful and you get to these countries and, hey, you know what I do? We take a trunk load of stewed fruit. Uh -huh. and, and when I was young and in vaudeville, all the actors went to the worst greasy restaurant, actors always do. And he said, I didn't do that. You know what I did? You have to say no. <laughs> I followed middle-aged ladies until they went to their lunch, and they would go to these nice tea rooms, and I ate there, and I saved my stomach that way. Uh, yeah, that's because his tea rooms, because his his first his partner, partner he thought died of food poisoning. Died of one. food poisoning. It turns yeah. he really died of tuberculosis, but right. uh, but Bob always attributed it to food poisoning because he was throwing mm -hmm. up or whatever. And, uh, and from then on, he, he stayed away from the greasy spoons and he ate in tea rooms. He was already eating for getting to be 100. You know, yeah. <laughs> Amazingly <laughs> healthy guy. Physical except, phenomenon. Except, I rode with him in a car once from NBC to something else. And he said, okay, here I go. Uh, Bob's asleep. Right. Five minutes. He yeah, well, he was notorious one. for being able to sleep, uh, you know. And then he could up. wake up and be ready to go. All right. Uh, before we leave, uh, your favorite, do you have a favorite Bob Hope laugh line gag? joke, a Bob Hope line? Mm, well, you have to say the most famous and probably one of the best is certainly uh, the Academy Awards, the famous op opening of the Academy Awards. Yeah, Welcome, welcome yeah. to the Academy Awards, or it's known in my house, Passover. <laughs> <laughs> Your timing's okay. Dick? I don't have, a, that's my favorite also. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, we call it my house, Passover. And then he'd get this huge laugh, watch his monologues, and, you can see what, and then he would do a little weight shift Mm, yeah. And get another laugh. Yeah, yeah. he yeah, could yeah, do yeah, that. Was yeah. a technique I, I learned and imitated from him. But 
Just anything that started with, hey, I wouldn't say Crosby's fat, but, you know. <laughs> what does he order at the bar in the Yukon in trying to look tough? Well, is it the milk? He, he orders lemonade. Oh, That's lemonade. the other, from Road to Utopia. Yeah. He ordered, he, he and Crosby are coming to try to impersonate yeah. roughnecks, and they go to the bar, and Crosby uh, orders a bottle of rot gut. And, and Bob says, I'll have a lemonade. Everybody turns and looks at him and says, in a dirty glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> That's it, all right. Uh, the book is called Dick Cavett, Brief Encounters. <laughs> What's well, that got to I do wanna... with Bob Hope? <laughs> may, may I also say about Dick Cavett that now PBS is running the play Hellman B. McCarthy, which... Thank you for knowing that. Yeah, that's I watched Googleable. it again. I had a wonderful time. Uh, theater close-up series has... You, you can, you can yep. go to PBS, uh, you know, what do you call it, where yeah, you watch PBS. stuff when you want to, and but, it's there. <laughs> or <laughs> Skype it's in Helen computer. McCarthy. And in the monologue that I do, as if it were years ago, I do Bob Hope and his shifting his weight and getting another laugh, and it works. Uh, the book is Hope, a terrific biography of Bob Hope by Richard Zoglin. Uh, not only a great biography, but also, I think, a very good social history of America, because Bob Hope, in many ways, touched on all that was the 20th century. It's a book that you want your friends to go home so you can get back to reading it. <laughs> very, can't, can't beat that. Yeah. Richard Zoglin, Dick Cavett, thanks for being our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night.